Now, a couple of great guests to talk about our hot topics of the day, which includes that topic. Lori Itkin is here. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, stocks and the stocks, particularly of marijuana <laughs> stocks yeah. that are coming up. And uh, we're going to be talking as well to, uh, and let me say this name again correctly, uh, Vikas Bajaj. That's correct, yes. Vic, right? Yes. Vic, thank you for being here. All right, Absolutely. so let's start with you. Sure. Um, in, in talking about this issue, and you're an attorney, right? So Yes. Weed is now legal in Colorado. They're having, uh, I mean, people are going on ski trips where they package up the thing, they, they, they pick you up the airport in a bus and you get to smoke weed and you go up to the, to the, to the, uh, to the resort. This is kind of a, a new thing for, for the United States. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this, the sale of marijuana is not a novel topic, right? We have states such as California that have had a bit of a rocky road in trying to really enforce it correctly and accurately and generally to the public. Well, Washington. and then locally we've had these medical marijuana dispensaries open, close, open, close, open, close. And, and, and there's a big debate between, you know, who has a stronger arm or who's going to be in the cookie jar first, the federal or the state government. But you look at Washington, state of Washington, I think they had produced over half a billion dollars in tax revenue in the first year, the last year, that's 2013, that they actually had their legal marijuana statutes in place. Now that was medical marijuana. Though, that's right? correct. And yeah. that's the real uh, distinction here is this is recreational marijuana. Yeah, this is opening it up. Right. But I want to correct you on one thing. Go ahead. I, the statute does not allow for people to charter a bus and to get some marijuana and say let's all you know no, they stop at a store or something yeah right? but the law says it has to be in an actual private residence with the residents the owner's permission so people probably will break the law on that i'm going to show you these ads about. because they have these package ads for for ski Wait. and and enjoy the weed you know what's mm -hmm. happening it's like they're all, all the tourists are lining up to buy the pot but there's nowhere they can smoke it because they don't have their own residence oh they have to go there. to a residence so that is part of the yeah, law they that's can't right. smoke that's a hotel right. no they're trying to go in the public spaces been, they can't has there do been it. an impact on the stock market you're a specialist in this stuff Oh, well, it's been crazy. First of all, 2013 was the best year we've had in the stock market since the mid-90s. And on Thursday, stocks of medical and medical and recreational marijuana companies just jumped through the roof. There are companies with stocks? I mean, oh, you can buy a stock? You can buy stock. Share now, stock? Most of them are penny stocks. I personally wouldn't buy them. I would wait for them to sort of mature. But if people want to track them or invest with paper money, go for it. But again, these are penny stocks that can be very volatile, and we really should see how the industry plays and out. And undercapitalized quite a bit. I yeah. believe that's what the research says. Some They're of not going to be undercapitalized for long at these prices. <laughs> so. It depends on where the money goes. Well, we, that's true. We now, know said that. not including taxes. What right. are the taxes that that Colorado State and is going to re reap in this? Well, the state of Colorado has upwards of close to a 3% sales tax on any item, right, any commodity. But the specific tax is 28.2% on recreational marijuana. Wow. So we have close to, you know, 33% taxes. And when you're estimating what the value of the sales will be, the estimate is almost $100 million in the first half of the year, the half of the fiscal year. I just did the computation in my head. If it's $400 an ounce, not including taxes. Your taxes are another hundred bucks at thirty-three. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a five hundred dollars an ounce. Who's being? Who, who, who can afford weed at this price? People who don't want to break the law and spend more money in hiring a criminal defense attorney to defend <laughs> themselves in court. That's, That's who. probably true. That is probably true. All right. Now the second topic I wanted to get. We'll throw this in and kind of go back and forth. Um, Sergio Garcia is the first uh, person illegally in the country who has been authorized by the state Supreme Court to practice law. He, he, he was a paralegal. He went through the law school. He graduated. He went through the bar exam. He passed. Uh, but the problem was he was not legally uh, in the country or citizen of the country, which heretofore has been the minimum standard to, right. to become a practicing lawyer in the state of California. What's your reaction to that? Because there's a lot of concern about this. There is, and, and for correct reasons or incorrect reasons, if you actually look at the opinion by the California Supreme Court, it's a very methodical dissection of the history of this case of Mr. Garcia. Yeah. See, what ended up happening in 1996, there was federal legislation that said we're going to control who can be the proper recipients of federal benefits, welfare, uh, WIC, programs like that that were more federally based. Part of it says any professional license should only be held by citizens. However, in that 1996 legislation, the federal government recognized the fact that states should have the authority to change things as they see fit. We see the, mar the marijuana laws, and now we're seeing it in different areas. But it's sort of a built-in control. We want to appease the constituency. Things change. Times change. 
And in the 1996 legislation, there is a provision that allows states individually to change that to exception. That. Exactly. Now, didn't California previously, though, have a requirement? Because I went through the bar a lot of years ago, and I thought that one of the requirements was you had to be a citizen. That's correct. But it changed. Obviously, the governor last year wrote legislation in after a lot of pressure and said, hey, the right thing to do is to focus on the most relevant topic, and that is the moral turpitude. Is being here with a petition pending, as Mr. Garcia Yeah, he had, wants by to be a way. citizen. Exactly. He has applied. Exactly. So he's gone, gone through the normal... I wish he would have gotten the citizenship first. It would have, would have, made, would have obviated all this. It, it would have, but it may not have addressed an important issue. Those, that is, people who are educated with the proper credentials to practice law and people who have the moral turpitude in order to practice law ethically and professionally should be allowed to practice law. I'll give law. you all that, but there's another issue that I think people have sure. raised about this, and that is the loyalty of a non-citizen in implementing the laws, officer of the court, implementing the laws, defending the Constitution, defending the, uh, the rights of citizens under that Constitution. That's all part of being an American. Shouldn't you be an American first, again, whether born here or, or naturalized, whatever, should you be an American first before you go into that function? See, and that's a very interesting question, and that's something we were looking forward for the California Supreme Court to actually answer for us. But what ended up happening is the California they legislation there, said, <laughs> you know what, we know the right thing to do here is to make an exception, to follow the federal that was the legislation. the politically right thing to do, the politically correct thing to do. The court found that the legislator did, did the right thing, okay? And so that's yeah. a moot question, but All a very right. interesting one well, nonetheless. It's, no, and the public, gee, believe me, there's a large part of the public that wants that one answered. All right, let me get back to Lori because I wanted to talk about stocks this year, yeah. as you said, have exploded in 2013, another big issue, and San Diego had its fair share of it. Absolutely, that's right, that's right. So one, number one is Leap Wireless, who I used to work for a long time ago. Let's talk, well, let me, let me talk, yeah. I think we have a slideshow, do we not? Let's talk about the, uh, the slideshow because if we're gonna take this we're going to take it in order, I believe. And here, for instance, is number one on the slideshow, maybe. And that, yep, there <laughs> I'm we not go. sure I can see that. Um, I can't see it either. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, and I know I had it you here. You had it here. So you had some. Here we go. Here we that go. was Acadia Pharmaceutical. Right. Talk about these as they come up because this is important. These pharmaceuticals seem to dominate this. List. Yeah, so pharmaceutical stocks always are very risky, but they have a lot of reward if they do well. They're very volatile because a lot of them have to deal with FDA regulation and all that kind of stuff. So we have Acadia Pharmaceuticals. So if they have a test, for instance, the FDA doesn't approve, then oh, it goes into the toilet. If they have the yes. test is approved, then suddenly the stock is way up. Right, and also right before earnings, companies have earnings announcements every quarter, every three months, and you can see a lot of volatility in the stock up and down around earnings. So ISIS Pharmaceuticals has had a great year this year. Uh, Centaurus, um, BOFI Holding, and Leap Wireless. Now talk about Leap yeah. Wireless. So it's called Cricket Wireless is the brand name. They got bought. They got bought by AT&T. The stock had been just sitting in the gutter, I know, because I owned restricted stock and stock options on it and because you were, used to be employed there I used so to be you employed took some there. of your compensation and these and these sure. just, you're sitting there looking at the stock value going okay when right when when when, when, when it happened AT&T is acquiring Leap Wireless that's right anytime what did it do to the stock huge I mean it was it was sitting in the five dollar range and went up to 17 bucks have you retired yeah. yet? I no. mean, this is <laughs> I'm a financial that's advisor now. That's $4 million stocks. That that, that's yeah. a, that sounds hey, pretty good. I waited a long time, okay? <laughs> now, you're a financial advisor. That's yeah. a funny st statement. We just got a bit of So what would you advise for 2014? Okay, so everyone's wondering. We had huge gains, 25%, 30% in domestic equities this year. Should you still be in stocks in 2014? Yeah. I would advise take some gains off the table, sell some of your stocks, and look at allocating your money among all asset classes. Because this year, the only asset classes that really were strong were U.S. stocks and Japanese stocks. In other years, emerging markets can be strong, commodities can be strong, real estate can be strong. So my tips for 2014 is don't put all your eggs in the domestic stock basket, spread them around. Lori and Vic, thanks for coming in. Great, Absolutely. Great my discussion. Pleasure. We appreciate it a lot.